class. This is awkward. Listen, it might look like I bailed on you for over a year. That's it. Don't expect me to apologize. Honestly, I'm just glad that no one got pregnant while I was away. Would have been really awkward explaining that to the principal. Anyway, I'm already bored of railing down an entire country's history, so let's try out something new. This is how to fail a democracy 101. So what's it going to be today? Bash the United States? You bet I won't. There are way more intriguing examples of fucking up a country. But speaking of the US, while I was away I kept hearing people say Congratulations idiots, you've just selected Hitler. And then that part of me that insists on correcting everyone is all like I beg your pardon? That's not Hitler. If anything, that's a clown. I'll show you how to elect Hitler. I'll show you the real thing. Children, this is how the Republic of Weimar failed. The Republic of Weimar, named after that thing Goethe created in the Duchy of Weimar before all attention buggered off to the revolution of 1848 as it came bursting through the door, frantically flapping its willy around, was off to a rough start. Germany just lost the Great War, and the old elite that was in charge of this train wreck for the last couple of years fucked off to someplace else, so that the ruined economy and the bones of being the loser of the war was now resting on a democratic parliament that up to this point barely held any responsibilities whatsoever. But after a couple of years of turmoil, things were actually looking pretty good. The economy was roaring, Germany re-entered the international community and accepted the new borders, well, most of them, and that was largely thanks to three people, Friedrich Ebert, Gustav Stresemann and that third one no one talks about. Stresemann is an interesting one. While he was chancellor for one year, he is regarded as one of the best foreign ministers to ever exist, goddammit. Most intriguing though is how he came to be, you know, technically he was a right-winger, but above all he was a realist. He used to support the emperor and only stopped doing that as it became clear to him that it's either democracy or receiving your mail armed while most of your neighborhood's on fire. And he did well. He was responsible for ending the occupation of the Rhineland, reconciliation with the Allies, first and foremost France, revised the Treaty of Versailles multiple times, he got on good terms with Soviet Russia and made Germany rejoin the League of Nations as a member of the Central Committee, no less. And all that in just three years while suffering from a life-threatening disease. Badass is no word to describe that man. However, he was far from being a saint. One could call him quite opportunistic when it comes to achieving his own goals. Also, his decision to accept all the new German borders except the one to Poland proved to be, well, problematic. Besides that, he was usually amongst the first people to approve an intervention by the army whenever things threatened to go south. And the one in charge of the army was Friedrich Ebert, the president, elected for seven years and equipped with more power than God. He was also the one to appoint the cabinet, including the chancellor. Most importantly though, in the Weimar constitution, the president had the option to enact laws via emergency decree without having to ask the parliament first. But Mr. Teacher Guy, doesn't that sound like dictatorship, you might ask? Yes. Yes, it does, but it came in handy. For you see, in the early years of the Republic, there were plenty of attempts at overthrowing the government by armed militias. Using the military and emergency legislation avoided the government to be overthrown. However, even though the parliament was capable of repealing the emergency laws, even the possibility to abuse all their power proved to be, well, problematic for a democratic system. Nonetheless, Ebert kept the fragile Republic on track until he suddenly died in 1925 at age 54 because he didn't treat his appendicitis, that idiot. So now the German people were to elect a new president. This is where hindsight comes in. You know, in some aspects the Weimar Republic was an even more democratic system than today's Germany. The people even got to elect their head of state directly. Once. The problem is, if a society up until recently lived in a monarchy, who do you think are they going to elect as head of state? A proper democrat or an old war hero who'd rather see the emperor back on the throne? Needless to say, they've elected Paul von Hindenburg, a monarchist who was regarded as the man who won the war against Russia. Someone with a distant stance to the democratic system, but most importantly he was very, very old, like 77 at his inauguration. And now you might remember what kind of power the president has and yeah. Shit's not going to end well, is it? Surprisingly though, he did stay true to the constitution in his first couple of years. And the country was still doing exceptionally well. Stresemann was working like that busy little bee that he was. And I shit you not, it only took one month to destroy everything. Early in October 1929, Stresemann at last died to his disease. And about 20 days later, the US financial market crashed. Overnight, all the US American companies pulled their investments out of Germany, resulting in mass unemployment, and you lot are still complaining about 2016. The people started blaming the politicians for their incompetence, perhaps rightfully so, the KPD and the NSDAP picked up on this and yada 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 yada. But Mr. Teacher Guy, why didn't they just ban parties that were against the constitution? Well easy, parties weren't a specific part of the constitution back then. That's different now, but you couldn't just ban them like they were to follow the bloody thing. 
The thing is, you can't really blame the people to have voted for these parties. If you take a look at the list of German chancellors and cabinets at the time, you'll notice that barely one of them ruled for more than a year. There's no wonder why nothing got done. If your government changes every year, how are you supposed to keep track of that circus? Why even bother? Here's another thing that on paper sounds incredibly democratic but proved to be just as stupid. There were no restrictions on political parties. If your party got voted for, then congratulations, you're now part of the parliament. Sounds good, right? Many parties equals a lot of political representation, right? Well, the reality was that you had coalitions that depended on way too many parties. There were two different SPDs for fuck's sake. And it might have happened that if you were chancellor, you wake up one morning and realize that your cabinet has not the minority vote because that one bloke from the centralist Christian party of tilting your bowler hat slightly to the left had joined the opposition. So when the cabinets had a hard time securing their majority, how did any bills get made? Well, technically there was still the possibility for the president to take matters into his own hands and declare the state of emergency. And when old man Hindenburg heard that the great coalition of SPD and centre parties had broken up in the light of the financial crisis, he decided to dissolve the parliament and scheduled re-elections in hope that the SPD, an old enemy of his since the days of the empire, would lose their influence. Of course, the reality was that it's been over half a year since the financial market crashed, mass unemployment was still a thing and the common people were just tired of this shit. The next time the parliament came together, the communists and the Nazis had become major players. So there was just no way for the democratic parties to fall a coalition and Hindenburg had to appoint cabinets with a minority in parliament and ruled via emergency law exclusively. It's fairly easy to say that from this point on the German democratic system was factually dead. And when the people see that their higher-ups in Berlin just ignore their anger and are now literally ruling without a legitimately elected majority, what's the point of voting for democratic parties in the first place? The only thing preventing Hitler from becoming chancellor at this point was an old senile Paul von Hindenburg. That the opposition in parliament kept repealing his laws didn't make the situation any better. And after a lot of persuasion and maybe a bit of dementia, he decided on allowing the only coalition left possible. The nationalistic party centering around the NSDAP with Hitler as chancellor. Hindenburg died shortly thereafter so that the NSDAP merged the chancellorship and the president into one. Which from that point on meant they could do whatever the fuck they wanted on a constitutional basis. So, let us summarize what exactly went wrong here. Undemocratic nation forced to get used to democracy, a president with the competencies to disable said democracy, no mentioning of parties and their duties in the constitution, no strict regulations on how a political party joins the parliament, inability of forming a government that lasts for longer than a year, leading politicians dying way too early, electing an old monarchist to be president, and last but not least, inability of the ruling parties to solve and prevent the consequences of a financial crisis. So... There we go, Germany's second largest screw-up in all of its glory. But an important screw-up nonetheless. You see, only by looking back at our mistakes of Weimar, we were eventually able to write a constitution that actually fucking works.